Well, greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. And we're glad you could join us today for another in our continuing series of Ask the Expert programs. Today, we're going to talk to our Director of Collections, Sue McKay, about how to care for three-dimensional artifacts, specifically, though, artifacts like baseballs. Baseball is something that many people collect. They love to get autographs on baseballs, but they are tricky when it comes to preservation. And we're going to get some thoughts from Sue about that in just a couple of moments. Uh, again, we will take uh, your questions later on in a Zoom group chat. Uh, we'll do that toward the end of the program. Right now, though, we do want to welcome once again to our microphones here on the Hall of Fame's unofficial channel, Sue McKay, the Hall's Director of Collections, a longtime employee in our collections department. Sue, uh, how are you doing post-World Series? I know, doing well. Got to catch up on some sleep. Uh, those games went kind of late, as they always do, but uh, that was very fun. Very fun World Series, especially if you're a Dodger fan. Absolutely. Very exciting. Went to six games. Uh, there was some drama in other ways uh, <laughs> after the game as well. Um, but the season, uh, despite all the naysayers, the season was completed. A 60-game regular season and then an unprecedented 16-team postseason. Four rounds of postseason, concluding with the Dodgers winning the world championship. All right, so today we've got um, uh, an important program because baseballs are something that a lot of people like to collect, especially they use them to get autographs, and um, they can be a little bit difficult in terms of what can happen to them. And we see right off the bat here an example of um, discoloration that can take place, fading autographs, chemical reactions, and also the use of shellac. And we're going to talk about all these things. First off, though, we want to point out, this is pretty amazing, we have 10,000 baseballs in our collection here at the Hall of Fame. Uh, 10,000. That's just an amazing number to me. It is a lot. And um, we have them kind of divided. Uh, we have our uh, Hall of Famer signed subset of baseballs. And though those are all organized alphabetically by last name of the Hall of Famer. And it was always tradition here at the Hall to have our new inductees sign uh, one to two dozen baseballs for us every year. And so those are added to the permanent collection. And we've We've done that for many, many years. We go back to Ty Cobb uh, and go right on up to the present. So that's a, a subset of the collection. And then the other subset is uh, just regular season, uh, postseason uh, team signed baseballs uh, from various events throughout the history of the game. So are all the baseballs from the 20th and 21st century, or do we have some that go back to the 1800s? Uh, nothing. Uh, certainly we have baseballs, uh, nice little leather lemon peel baseballs uh, from the 19th century. We have some of those. And um, we've got some baseballs in our uh, Taking the Field exhibit uh, up on the floor. So we've got the early baseballs that were actually composed of uh, horse hair. Uh, we actually have some balls that uh, the lemon peel has, the stitching has come undone. And you can actually see the interior of those baseballs. Uh, and they have a very, very different uh, core to them and composition. Uh, so those early balls are wonderful and uh, uh, of course are sought after. Um, but on the flip side, those baseballs don't have a lot of history to them because, uh, you know, there wasn't collecting in those days. And so people didn't write down where they were from, games that were played with them. Uh, they're just early examples of uh, very early baseballs used uh, in the early game. That's right. Of course, we do have the famed Doubleday ball, which was allegedly the ball that was used by Abner Doubleday back in the 1830s. Uh, I believe that's currently on display, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's uh, always actually been on display. And, and that's a great example of a uh, baseball where the seams have come undone and you can actually see uh, the inner material. And that's, I believe, on the second floor, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yep. 
Yeah. Yes, it is. So for people that are coming here, and we hope uh, that you do, we're open every day for the rest of the year, except for uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, and then uh, New Year's Day of next year will be closed. But uh, other than that, we will remain open 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Sue, let's talk about the first bullet point here, the discoloration. And we see it with this Washington Senators baseball what is causing this discoloration? It looks like it's, it's a yellowing or a browning of the ball that's taking place. Why is that happening? Well, uh, in the early days, uh, it was thought that placing a coating on the ball would protect any signatures from fading away. Mm. And uh, that was uh, quite commonly done. Uh, but what happened was over time, this shellac uh, interacted chemically with the leather on the baseball and turned the surface this brown shellac -y color. Uh, and uh, not only was it bad for the leather, but over time it starts drying out and peeling off and it peels the signatures right off with it. Mm. So it was actually, um, you know, a bad idea and a bad thing to do, but uh, you know, back in the day, nobody knew. They thought, uh, you know, varnish or, or some sort of coating would protect it. So uh, when you see a ball like this, you automatically know that it was shellacked. A couple of things interesting here. Um, I always thought shellac was spelled with a K, but sure enough, I looked it up. You guys were right. It's shellac with just the C at the end. So I learned something right there. Hey, great. Uh, yes, we, we have a number of, of those. So we uh, we got a lot of practice in spelling it. Very good. I, that's, I always thought I was good at spelling, but then uh, not so good on shellac. So I, I learned <laughs> that. When I'm curious, though, Sue, when did people in the industry start to realize that the shellacking was counterproductive? Well, I think once... Uh, you know, after these baseballs were shellacked and they sat around for a while, uh, then people looked back at their baseballs and saw what was happening. So, you know, I think certainly, um, you know, the 70s and 80s uh, saw a lot of brown baseballs out there uh, that folks have in their own personal collections. Uh, and certainly, you know, we have some in our permanent collection as well. They were just things donated a very long time ago and have turned this color over time. So it's unfortunate, but um, all you can do if you have something like this is just keep it in a consistent temperature and humidity so that it doesn't dry out and flake off mm -hmm. and keep it in an acid-free container as well. As you mentioned, Sue, the autographs are fading as well as the discoloration taking place. You also mentioned here that the, the ink is, is bleeding. Does that mean it's, it's starting to blur? Yes. Yeah, so what happens is the minute uh, the pen touches the leather, a chemical reaction starts occurring between the ink and the leather. So um, right off the bat, the minute you get the autograph, uh, things start happening chemically that uh, that are kind of unfortunate, but it's the laws of science. So uh, that's why it's very important about the pen that you use to get autographs, uh, because these ball uh, the ballpoints, the modern pens uh, will just fade right away um, in the light. Uh, so it's, uh, and conversely, uh, when Babe Ruth signed a, a baseball back in the 20s with India ink with fountain pens, they still look beautiful today. Mm. And that's purely the difference in the ink that was used. So your guess, Sue, is that this ball that was signed by the senators in 1944, this was done with a ballpoint pen? Well, yes, it certainly looks that way. And that yeah. just isn't going to last very long. Now, you mentioned the India ink, um, which I've heard of. I don't know much about, though. Well, it's a it's a really an artist's ink. Artists use it um, for their pen and ink drawings. Uh, so it's, it's very well known in the art world and can be purchased at any art supply store. Uh, you can either get it right in the bottle, uh, the, you know, the free freestanding ink in the in the ink bottle. 
Um, or there are wonderful pens that you can buy now that are acid-free pens. Uh, so you'd want to use either one of those to obtain your signatures. So the the old uh, felt tip pens will fade quickly. The ballpoint pens will fade quickly. How about Sharpies, which have become very popular over the last Sharp, year? Yeah, Sharpies were very popular when they were first introduced, uh, but started fading right away. And so the Sharpie company actually came out with a permanent ink Sharpie. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, they recognized what was happening as well. And uh, uh, I still personally would um, go with the uh, acid-free archival ink pen. Uh, that's what we have our Hall of Famers use to sign the, the baseballs that go into that permanent collection that I talked about, single signed. Uh, and um, they actually have started using them as well on their uh, baseball uh, signings. Uh, because uh, it's becoming more well known now that that's the ink that's going to last. So that's what I would recommend. And of course, if you're someone who collects autographs, you know, you need to bring those specific pens with you. Um, that's correct. You yes. Know, it's good for a couple of reasons. You have the right kind of pen, but you also don't want to expect the player to produce a pen on his own. You may very well not have one, probably doesn't have one, uh, especially at the ballpark. So let's talk about the chemical reactions. And apparently this actually involves something that is going on inside the baseball and it can somehow seep out onto the surface. Am I right in saying yes, that? Yes, yes. Um, so when a baseball is manufactured, it has a very small rubber, tiny rubber core. And then everything is built around that rubber core. So adhesives are used inside to uh, fuse everything together to produce the ball, to, to make it round and spherical, and uh, which is fine. So that's what we're looking at is, is a regular baseball. But over time, in the interior of the baseball, those particular components start breaking down, especially the adhesives will start uh, decaying over time. And what happens is, is that it actually will, uh, will off gas, what we call off gas, and that will come out through the exterior of the baseball. And that is why it is so important not to place a baseball in a container that cannot breathe, because all leather items have to breathe, whether it's a glove or a baseball or a leather jacket, uh, whatever it is, leather has to breathe. That's just the, the basic tenant of that material. So if you place this leather baseball in an airtight container, you're getting this off-gassing, which has nowhere to go. Mm. And so it becomes sort of like a stew uh, in this airtight, airtight container. And uh, that will cause discoloration over time. So it's it's imperative that you not place these leather baseballs in airtight containers. We're going to talk more about that in a few moments. I do want to ask you a little bit more about this baseball that's pictured here, Sue. Uh, it is from the Senators, 1944. Now, would this be cowhide or horsehide? And does that matter either way? In terms um, of Really, it doesn't matter either way because the the interior components are pretty much the same. It's it, it's hide, you know, whether it be cow or horse, it's a hide. So um, it's just like if you have a suede jacket versus a leather jacket, it's still, you know, a natural material. So uh, again, the same um, rules apply. I seem to remember it was sometime in the seventies that baseball switched from horse-side to cow-hide. Right. And, so it um, has to be a horse-side baseball then. Yeah, and, and plus the uh, location where baseballs were made changed as well. So um, it was Haiti for a while. Uh, of course, it was United States uh, for a while. So the places uh, where they were produced changed. Uh, and then certainly uh, horse-hide, cow-hide. And then, of course, the interior components, as I mentioned before, the very early baseballs were 
straw and string and you know whatever folks could you know gather up to to make uh, something that they could play with I want to talk about things that we can do in in terms of maybe not restoring a ball um, a lot of that damage cannot be reversed but certainly from this point on in, in terms of how you store your collection and how you make sure that these items are gonna last for as long as they can. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the archival ink for autographs. You mentioned the India ink earlier that Babe Ruth used. Um, what, what, are, what are the brands that uh, you would recommend that maybe the Hall of Fame uses in, in terms of ink? I assume it's, it's available on the internet. Maybe it can be purchased at art stores as well. It can, and um, any art stores will have them uh, because uh, these are also used for artists that, that draw as well um, on their, uh, their artwork. Uh, but this is called a Pigma pen, P-I-G-M-A, Pigma pen. Uh, it comes in different line widths, which is important because um, I get asked that question a lot. Uh, not only about the width of the line, but also colors. It does come in different colors as well, blue, green, red, black, uh, but it's all archival ink. And uh, these pens are available out there on the internet and in the artist supply stores. In fact, they were uh, available at Walmart um, as well. I haven't been in a Walmart in a very long time, but I know they were available there at, at some point. Uh, but these these are the pens that you want to use, and this is what our Hall of Famers use uh, when they sign for our collection. So it's a micro pigment ink. Uh, it's waterproof, fade proof, and as I mentioned, you can get different line widths, uh, so it, it can come very thin uh, uh, and go to a thicker line uh, because you know everybody has a a, a a line width that they like that they mm -hmm. prefer. Um, and signing a baseball isn't easy. Uh, the pros make it look very easy, but I, uh, somebody once asked me to sign a baseball and oh my goodness, it, it's difficult if you don't have practice. Yeah. It, you know, we're used to signing flat surfaces. I mean, it's what it comes down to. And obviously, you know, a baseball, unless it's been flattened, is not going to provide uh, that easy a surface. Right. In terms of ink color, Sue, uh, does any of that matter in terms of preservation or is that just preference? It's really just preference. Um, I think most most go for the black because it's traditional. Now, Ty Cobb signed in green ink, and um, I think he's the only person in the collection that uh, signed in green ink. So, you know, that's a special thing. That's something that he's known for. Um, but, of course, back in those days, he wasn't uh, using a Pigma pen. Uh, but um, I think, you know, traditionally, I think the black is still something that most people go with uh, just because I think it's the contrast between the black ink and the white background. So I think it's easier to pick up all the little nuances uh, of the signature. And of course, signatures change over time. You could have a player sign in his 20s and 30s and then have the same player sign in his 50s or 60s and it's going to look different that's mm. just the way uh it is we age and our handwriting changes over time so um i think it's easier to pick up the little nuances of a signature if it's you've got that stark contrast of black on white that's an excellent point one thing that we need to emphasize when handling any of these baseballs, don't use your bare hands. Correct. When handling anything that you have in your personal collection, uh, you use either white cotton gloves. You can use the nitrile gloves. That's N-I-T-R-I-L-E. Those are the, uh, uh, the gloves that you often see medical folks wearing. Uh, but yes, it's imperative that you not handle with your hands because the, our finger oils, even if we've just washed our hands, we still have oils in our hands that will imprint right onto anything that you pick up. So better safe than sorry, just handle whatever you have with gloves. Sue, so I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Sandlot, which came out in the early 1990s. Yes. It's a great movie, it's a lot of fun. 
But as someone who's into preservation, uh, the scene where he takes the Babe Ruth ball, they start playing with it, and then the dog gets it, and that must be nightmarish for a person like you. Well, yeah, it's funny because we actually have that ball in the collection. Really? Yes, we do. And it's uh, very chewed up, you know, and uh, I imagine slobbered on by the dog. Um, so, yes, that's a that's out of the ordinary, uh, but certainly something, you know, you never know uh, what you're going to get in the collection. So, uh, again, important to store it as best you can because it's coming to you uh, chewed up and um, and used uh, as most of the baseballs are that, that come here. So uh, best to use the proper storage container, an acid-free box. Uh, here, uh, we happen to use these boxes that have 12 compartments uh, because it's, we have so many baseballs, as you mentioned, over 10,000. So um, it, it would be a nightmare to store them individually, although they do have little individual boxes, acid-free boxes that you can buy uh, with either clear lids or, or regular lids. Uh, but we choose to use the dozen uh, boxes because they're easier to stack uh, and uh, easier to find things we're looking for. So it just really depends on the size of your collection. They come in different configurations. So you, if you have six baseballs, you can buy a box for six. If you have one or two, you can buy individuals. If you have dozens, you can put them in the dozen boxes. It, it really depends what you have. But it's important to use these boxes because they're going to allow the leather to breathe. So that that's not cardboard, it's acid-free board. Big difference because the uh, cardboard has is made of acidic components. So again, over time, if your baseball's touching that acidic box, it's going to discolor uh, the ball. Uh, so you need to, to get the right box to do the best you can to preserve. So for someone that wants to get one of these boxes, are they are they simply called baseball boxes or do they? What's, yeah, what's the they are. And um, the great thing is they're, they also make them for other sports as well. So you can get um, little boxes that house golf balls, uh, tennis balls, softballs, footballs, hockey pucks. Um, they've really branched out into all the sports now. And that's a wonderful thing because everybody, you know, no matter what their collections are, what sports they follow and, and um, purchase items, they can find a container that's going to work for them. Now, this will probably sound like an obvious point, but, you know, we want to emphasize that as well. When you're putting these baseballs in a box, you obviously don't want the autograph leaning up against, even though it's acid free, you don't want the autograph leaning up against the sides and you want right. the autograph visible. So it's got to be up in the air. Right. And, and what we do, we'll cover that uh, section, that 12 component section with a piece of acid free tissue so that it's touching the tissue and not the underside of the box. Okay. So just an, a little extra layer of, um, of safety. Now, I have on my notes here uh, a supplier uh, named Gaylord. Tell us about that. Correct. Um, Gaylord, www.gaylord.com, G-A-Y-L-O-R-D. They're located in Syracuse, New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have all of these boxes that I've mentioned, um, not only for baseball, but for other sports as well. And that really came out of a conversation that I had with them because we do have some golf balls in the collection. We have a base uh, golf ball used by Lou Gehrig with his name on it. Um, we have a football shaped humidor signed by uh, Ty Cobb and Newt Rockney. Uh, we have uh, a hockey puck that came from Boston uh, that was used. And um, so we we have a soccer ball as well. So. Uh, we just don't cover baseball. We have other other items uh, from other sports in this permanent collection as well. So I had a chat with the folks at Gaylord and uh, and said, gosh, is there any way you could do some other boxes that would fit other sports memorabilia? And uh, they saw a great need for it because they were getting a lot of inquiries as well. Mm -hmm. And so they really branched out and were able to configure 
uh, boxes for a lot of different sports related items. So uh, going on that site, you'll see a lot of different types of boxes and also for uniforms as well. It's not just uh, baseballs, but anything baseball related, uh, whether it's a bobblehead or a uniform, uh, gloves, shoes, uh, you name it, they've got a box that will be able to store it. We're going to take questions later on, but I do have a question that ties in perfectly with our next subject. It's from uh, Glinda Parado, and she wants to know, what about those individual display boxes like the plastic square cases with UV protection? Uh, I have a feeling you're not a fan of those. Not a fan. Um, in the early days, uh, the plastic boxes were just plain uh, plastic. And then um, the industry decided to add a UV coating uh, because preservation was becoming a thing. Uh, but uh, it's still plastic and it still traps the off gassing. Mm. So uh, it's just better to use these acid free boxes. And there are a number of companies that carry these types of containers. Um, Gaylord is one, but certainly University Products is out there. If you just Google archival boxes, you'll come up with a number of different companies that will, uh, that carry this type of thing. Um, and you can compare pricing and compare configurations and you know try to match what's gonna uh, help your own individual collection. So we need to steer away from the plastic cubes. How about those little pedestals that you sometimes see balls displayed on? Yeah, I mean, if it's plastic, uh, plastic has chemicals in it. That's by the very nature of plastic, it has oils, uh, petroleum, uh, plastic is a petroleum product, so any type of plastic really is is not recommended for the storage of anything. Uh, any any type of long term storage, these items have to be able to breathe. Would wood or metal be better? Uh, no, because they don't breathe either. Uh, you know, metal is is going to trap off gassing. Uh, Wood has its own issues because it, it expands and contracts in, in differing temperatures and humidities. So really best to just keep it simple and get the archival acid-free box. And you think displaying in that way is probably the best way to go? Yeah, and they actually have uh, clear lids uh, so that if you do want to have it where you can see it, uh, they do have clear lids and they have uh, the regular lids, which is what we store them in. Now, if you're going to display the baseballs, and let's say you do it with this box right here, and that's a good way to do it, it's important not to keep them on display all the time. Tell us Correct. about that. Yes, any light is bad. So any light will fade anything. It isn't just baseballs, but... Um, anything that has a uh, print on it will fade, whether it be a newspaper or, you know, a baseball card, especially with the colors, uh, but certainly baseballs as well. So best to keep them in the dark and a consistent temperature and humidity. And then if somebody comes over, you can grab this box, bring it out and uh, show the family and friends, you know, what you've collected over time. Uh, but then when everybody leaves, you can put it back and uh, and you'll know that that it's uh, out of the light uh, because most homes don't have uh, fiber optic lighting, which is what we use out on the exhibit floor that does not uh, exude any heat. Uh, very low foot candles, about three or four foot candles, uh, uh, which is why most areas of the museum appear dark. It's for the benefit of the artifacts. They should be in very low light uh, and away from heat. But all the other light sources, fluorescent, incandescent, they're giving off a, a certain amount of heat and damaging light as well. So best to keep anything you care about in the dark, uh, especially if you're going to hand things down, or if you're purchasing things for an investment. Um, you know, I, I've had folks call and, and ask, how can I bring a signature back on this baseball? 
there is no way currently to do that. Um, uh, they've watched a lot of television as we all have and um, watching the CSI labs and, uh, but we're just not to the point yet where we can bring artifacts back because of that chemical reaction. It's, it's sunk into the leather and already has started to spread. Yeah. So uh, there's just no way to pull it back out uh, using any type of technology we currently have. So the best thing you can do is protect it the minute you get that autograph, put it in a proper container out of the light. That's the best thing you can do. So here at the Hall of Fame, we have a baseball on exhibit. Do we rotate it in and out, put it in storage for a while? We do. Um, and also uh, we will rotate, uh, if things happen to go out on loan, we will have the borrowing institution rotate, you know, if there's a signature, we will have them rotate it uh, while on exhibit um, because that those items need to rest and uh, and be out of even though the low level the light levels are very low we have very stringent guidelines when we loan things to other institutions we want them to follow the same parameters that we do here so uh, it's best for these types of items to rest or be rotated as you mentioned we're going to start taking questions for sue mckay in just a moment we have a number of questions coming in in our zoom group chat as we continue our discussion, the care and preservation of baseballs. Before we get to those questions though, a reminder that uh, we'd love you to support our programs if you can. And the way you can do that is by becoming a member of the Hall of Fame. Through the Hall of Fame's membership program, fans from around the country and the world can be part of the team that tries to preserve the game's history while celebrating the all-time greats. If you become a member, you'll receive a full roster of benefits including unlimited admission to the museum for a full year. And you also get all six copies of our magazine, Memories and Dreams. It does come out every month. Uh, for many, the benefits of membership cannot be simply held in their hands. Their membership brings with it the knowledge that they are a part of baseball's history. Uh, we uh, hope though that you can be a part of something greater. And if you wanna become a member or just learn more about it, visit our website. It is baseballhall.org. Again, that's baseballhall.org and then slash join. Baseballhall.org slash join, and that'll take you to the membership link. You can read about the many different levels of membership. We have uh, youth members, we have family memberships, we have high level memberships for those who are able to afford that. Uh, but give it a look, baseballhall.org slash join. All right, let's get ready to take uh, some questions. And we do have a number that are already coming in on the Zoom group chat, so many that I'm, I'm gonna have to scroll backward here to get to the, uh, to the beginning. Uh, let's see, question from Jason Curtis. What line width does the Hall of Fame use for baseball? So I guess this is in response to the Pigma pen. What line width do we use for that pen, Sue? Oh, I have a number one here. Um, now, for accessioning the objects, uh, we have to put a, a number on every single piece that comes into the Hall of Fame. Uh, so sometimes if we have very tiny artifacts coming in, we'll use a very, very thin line uh, to, ex to write those numbers on the pieces. So we actually have the whole set that goes from the thinnest to the thickest. And depending what we're doing, we'll pick an appropriate pen. Uh, but uh, the thicker, if you're taking these baseballs out for, for the players to sign, you want the thicker uh, line uh, because it's just going to be more readable uh, and, and, and there's just more ink on the baseball. So uh, that's really you know, what you'd wanna use to obtain autographs. Here's a follow-up to that. It's from Scott Blake. Does the accession number sticker, and Scott is citing the example of the 44 Senators baseball, does that sticker contain a special archival quality adhesive that doesn't leave any residue? Actually, that's not a sticker. Um, it's actually uh, a, 
there's a, a, uh, a set you can buy from Gaylord for accessioning purposes. So um, it's all archival. So you would place, uh, it kind of looks like white out, but it's archival. So you would place a white, a very small white stripe. You would use this pen to write your accession number on, and then you would put a clear coating on top of it once that uh, has the Figma pen has dried. And that's how we accession uh, baseballs. So there's so no it, adhesive on that. There is no adhesive on that whatsoever. Um, and you don't want to have adhesive on anything, no matter what you have in your collection. That adhesive is going to leave a mark. It's going to get stickier over time and it's going to be a nightmare. So no adhesives on anything. We have another question from Glinda. What is the best way to have an autographed baseball authenticated when the signatures change over time? And I guess she's referring to what you had said earlier about as we get older, our autograph does change. Yeah, and that's something that, you know, the authenticators take into account. Um, certainly if, if you know the approximate age uh, of the person that you're obtaining the signature from, and of course, that's gonna just the look of it's gonna change over time. Uh, but as I said, if if they then signed something later, twenty years later, it would be a miracle if it looked exactly the same. And and that's true of our own signatures as well. Whether we're doing checks or whatever we're signing, um, I think mine changes almost day to day. Uh, but the authenticators are able to uh, they have a base of information that they utilize. And, and certainly that's what we have here as well. If we have a potential donation coming in of a baseball, we can compare it to baseballs that we have in the permanent collection. And uh, we know the years of our baseballs. We know when they were signed. Uh, so we can compare uh, the signatures, but it can get tricky. Uh, and so it, it takes a very, astute eye and a knowledged eye and also sometimes a very very powerful magnifier uh mm. to to look at these baseballs because some some signatures are just so hard to read uh you know let alone having an autograph change over time but trying to read autographs is really tough and i recommend that folks kind of do their own homework and go to baseball-reference.com They've got all the rosters for all the teams uh, over time. So just go on that site, find, you know, if you think you've got a team ball, go to the rosters and, you know, make the list of those autographs you can read on your ball and compare it to the different uh, team years. And you can very well narrow down potentially the, the year of your baseball. Now, That's my understanding is tip. that here at the hall, we don't authenticate private collections or. That, or yes, private that's, that's correct. That's are, correct. There, are there national organizations out there that can do that sort of thing? I assume for a price, but do they exist? Yes. Yes. The um, International Society of Appraisers is uh, one organization that has a, a wonderful website. It's www.isa appraisers.org and you can actually find an appraiser right on that site that's located in your local area that can do some work for you no matter what you want to have authenticated or appraised they have their own specialties so certainly um, you know sports memorabilia is a, uh, a specialty and uh, it's a really easy site to navigate and they have a, a phone number on the site as well that you can contact if you want to speak to a live person and have questions. That website again is isa-appraisers.org. isa-appraisers.org. Right. That's one of them. There are uh, others as well. And you know, if you just Google uh, appraisers or authenticators, uh, you will get a listing of, uh, folks and sites. And it's good to talk to different people and get different opinions. That's always a good thing, whether it's medical or whether it's concerning your sports memorabilia. 
always good to chat with a number of folks and get their views and um, and as Bruce, as you mentioned, pricing uh, uh, as well. Uh, here's an interesting comment from Reg Jones. There are many stories where a member of the team's coaching or support staff would sit in the dugout and sign players' names on baseballs to give out to fans. Does this really happen, to? It did, absolutely. And sometimes the wives of the players signed as well. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's that's the fun part of collecting is that there's – usually a story behind um, the piece. And if you're fortunate enough to know it, uh, it, it makes for, for very fun collecting. But yeah, clubhouse guys would sign, uh, wives would sign, uh, other folks would sign. Yeah, it happened. And uh, of course, the wives got very good at it. They knew their husband's signatures very well. So they could pretty much match it but the clubhouse guys as well signed a lot so they could get very adept at at signing um there was also um auto pens uh that you at the ballpark you could buy an autographed baseball that looks like a real autographed baseball but they're actually stamped signatures oh, okay. so what they would do is take the signature of a player and then just have it uh, be a stamp and it, it really if you don't look closely you can be fooled uh, to thinking it's a real autograph baseball but they're just stamps of the individual players you can tell if you look really closely um, but if you're seeing it from a distance it can because the signatures are different they are based on the individual players natural autograph here's an interesting question from Teresa Griggs I have some baseballs in archival boxes, but have noticed a white powder coming off of the baseballs. What is causing that? Yeah, that that could be um, kind of like a chalky type of substance. Um, it's best to watch those. I think anybody that has collections um, should be doing what Teresa is doing and watching their pieces because strange things can happen over time. Uh, so it'd be good to keep a log of, or, or photographs or both, and just keep an eye on all of your collections uh, because uh, things can happen. Certainly we know with uh, gloves that have been oiled, that oil will pu push back out to the surface and it'll look like mold, but it's called spew. And that's a white, chalky substance. Um, now on the, now the baseball, if it was handled a lot uh, back in the day, you know, something chemically is happening there. It could be that it's um, in a fluctuating temperature and humidity, which is changing the dynamic of the baseball. Uh, but certainly she should continue to watch uh, and see what's happening. From Stephen Lane, uh, this is interesting. If I create a space that lets some air into the plastic ball container, is that okay? I've had a lot of calls on that too. Yeah, that's letting the air in, but it's still a plastic container. So, you know, plastic is plastic. It's, it's not just about the airflow. It's about what's surrounding that ball. It's plastic, it's oil-based, and it's a a negative component that you really don't want to use. Bill Deere has a question. So is it the number one of the width that you would recommend for us civilians when we take our kids to the ballpark with a ball? Yeah, certainly um, you can buy these in these pens in packs or you can buy them individually. So I would say uh, whatever the thickest line is, uh, this is pretty thick, as you can see, mm -hmm. um, and that's a good, good line width uh, for players to use. I love this question. This comes in from Ann Lindsay. Are any players known for especially beautiful penmanship with their baseball signatures? 
that's a great question. And yes, there, uh, you know, a lot of players, as I mentioned, it's very hard to read their signatures, but there are some players that really take their time and they must have had uh, wonderful penmanship lessons in their youth uh, because uh, I think especially the older baseballs, 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, all those kids learn penmanship, which they're not really teaching anymore. Yeah. So I've never seen a terrible Babe Ruth signature, authentic Babe Ruth signature. You can always tell immediately that it's Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. And of course, all of those players um, during those time periods, uh, you know, listen to their teachers. They took the penmanship very seriously. And the, the, uh, the signatures are very nice and readable. One player that I remember, I don't know if I heard this from someone or read it, but Harmon Killebrew, I think, took special pride in his autograph. He took his time and had limited the number of autographs he could do in a certain number of minutes, but his autograph always came out beautifully. Does that ring a bell with you? Yes, it does, and that's very true. That's another player where uh, his signature can't be confused with anybody else's because it's it's so clear and concise uh, and and taking the time really matters. Uh, but of course, uh, that's hard if you're if a player's at a signing, they want to get as many done and and please the fans and make sure that everybody gets a baseball. Yeah. But just know if if you're in that situation, make a note uh, of who you're receiving when it happened, where it happened, you know, make a log so that it can go along with your collection because in 50 years, 100 years, no one's going to be around to remember those details and know them. So if you've got wonderful notes that go along with your collection, that will follow it for the life of the piece, which is, gosh, it can be 100 years. So it's worth taking the time to do that. You know, especially today, the, the modern day player is often in a hurry signing autographs and they might write the first letter of their last name and then just draw a line. Right. It's I've seen that. So you need to yes. have some reference. Who is this? <laughs> exactly. And and it's really worth the time, especially if you're going to pass this down in, in your family, um, have the notes to go with it. Or if you're uh, collecting for uh, for purposes of reselling having the notes you'll never no one will ever regret um having the notes to go with their collections it's when you don't have it and you're trying to rely on your memory or the memory of of grandparents or uh parents or whoever collected the things originally stories can change over time um we know that very well uh folklore uh, can be handed down that might be a little tweaked over the years and might not be as accurate as day one. So take the time, make the notes, then there's no question. Is it true, Sue, that when you sign autographs, you only sign Sue Mack? <laughs> I've signed one baseball and oh, I struggled with my whole name. I, I wrote the whole name, but I struggled. Yeah. <laughs> I should have done Sue Mack. Make it a little easier. Yeah, next time I'll do that. Yeah, I've I've misspelled my name on some of my own autographs. Not that I get asked for it a lot. Uh, we'll take one more question for Sue McKay. It comes in from Stephen Johnson. Uh, you talked about protecting single signed baseballs, but how do you protect team signed or multiple signed baseballs? And I guess what Steve is getting at is that the whole ball is covered in autographs. Right. So how? What, what part do you put on the, uh, on the surface? Well, that's where it's key to add that separate component of the acid-free paper, because you know, that can protect the ball. Uh, you can uh, just kind of envelope it in this acid-free paper, yeah. and then you're fine. All sides are protected. And, and so that's, that's what we've done as well. Excellent. Well, we've had a lot of questions. I think we've gotten to most of them. Uh, we want to thank Sue again for uh, joining us today for Ask the Expert, Caring for Three-Dimensional Artifacts. And before we let Sue go, just want to remind folks, a week from today, November 5th, 
Yeah, it's almost November. Next Thursday at 2 p.m., we are going to talk to former Major Leaguer, uh, former Major League umpire Gary Darling. Uh, he was a longtime umpire back in the 90s and the earlier part of the 2000s, retired, I believe, in 2014. Uh, Gary's going to talk about some memorable moments from his career, and he'll also discuss a charity he's very much involved with. It's the official charity for Major League umpires, and it's called Umps Care. So that's coming up next week. Uh, Sue, great job. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And feel free to uh, contact me with any questions that you have. I'm happy to answer. And the collections email again, Sue, is? Is registrar.org. So registrar so, at yep. baseballhall.org? Correct. So registrar at baseballhall.org. O-R-G. Thank you, Sue. Appreciate it. Uh, okay. Great job. And we thank everybody for all the terrific questions as well. We hope you've enjoyed our Ask the Expert program. Have a great day, everybody. Take care now. Take care.